I'm Ken Ito from the University of Hawaii. I want to tell you today about my experiences in using digital archives to teach a fifth year level reading course in Japanese literature. I'm a neophyte at this. I'm just now teaching my second course using these materials, but I'm enjoying it, and I think my students are too. This term, we've read parts of Natsume Soseki's Garasu no Naka, some untranslated stories by Akutaka Ryunosuke, and Agawa Hiroyuki's Nen Nen Sai Sai. At the moment, we're in the middle of reading Nakajima Atsushi's really wonderful Toragari. As you all know, the number of digital texts on Aozora Bunko have been growing at an incredible rate. There seems to be a small army of transcribers out there ready to turn the works of their favorite authors into digital files as soon as copyright expires 50 years after a writer's death. Things come up very quickly. For example, Nagai Kafu died in 1959, and thus copyright on his works expired in 2009. We already have 74 of his works on Aosara Bunko, including Sumidagawa and Bokuto Kiran. America Monogatari and Ude Kurabe are currently under development. For writers who died earlier, the hall is even bigger. There are 368 pieces by Aktagawa Ryunosuke and Aozora, and 102 pieces by Soseki, including all of the major novels. Uh, when I look through archives like this, I sometimes feel like a vulture because uh, I'm waiting for 50 years to die, 50 years to pass after an author dies. Uh, for example, uh, I know that Tanizaki Junichiro died in 1965. Uh, this means that copyright for his works will be, uh, what, over in 2015. And I can't wait to start teaching some of that stuff to my students. In addition to Aosora, I use the Penn Digital Library. This is a tiny archive by comparison, but Penn negotiates with living writers, presumably its members, so it contains materials that are still under copyright. I decided to use the digital archives for my course for a number of reasons. First, the aim of a reading course at this level is to create more independent readers. We want students to leave behind doctored texts and vocabulary lists and start reading on their own with appropriate reference works. In addition, I want students to come away inspired to read more Japanese literature outside of the classroom. It used to be the case that students uh, who, who wanted to read Japanese literature after they graduate, graduated had to live near a university library or in a major city with a Japanese bookstore in order to be able to uh, continue to have access for these kinds of, uh, to, to, to these kinds of texts. But digital, digital archives have changed that completely. People can now read Soseki, whether they're in Honolulu or whether they're in Hilo or even Pahala. The growth of on online dictionaries and dictionary apps was another reason to start teaching using digital archives. Dictionaries have changed over time from the Nelsons that I carried around as a student to Canon word tanks, but the reference ecosystem has taken a huge evolutionary leap with online dictionaries and apps. A student with a laptop can instantly get kanji readings with a Firefox plugin, Likai-chan, get definitions and usage examples from Jim Breen's JDIC, and access the full contents of the dictionaries Daijisen, Daijirin, and the progressive Ewa Jiten via sites like Gu and Kotobank. Much of this can be accessed from iPhones and iPads, which have their own powerful apps, like onboard versions of Daijisen and Karokawa's Kanjigen and Imiwa. Many of these references are entirely free, a boon to students on tight budgets. University students whose libraries subscribe to Japan Knowledge have an even more powerful set of reference works at their fingertips which I encourage students to use for deeper information. All of this means that there's now a convergence of web content and web references that makes web-based reading of Japanese materials 
a highly accessible activity. And this when we're clearly only at the beginning of the internet revolution of archives. We're also teaching now a generation of students who can't remember, remember a time before the internet and whose internet literacy is high. They're constantly reading web materials on various platforms, and they're already using web references in their language study. It thus seems like the right moment to teach students to read literature on the web. I have to admit that I do most of my own personal research and pers personal, re personal and research reading on paper, and I don't want to think about a time when digital materials will supply print. I actually don't think this is going to happen. But we've already reached a moment when the web is a major way of accessing text, and we need to prepare our students for the future. I also have a theoretical reason for doing this. I'm persuaded by Jerome McGann's view that the textual condition's only immutable law is the law of change. Thinking along these lines, I don't think that the manuscript of a work, its original publication, or the Zenshu edition is the single authoritative version of a text. All our textual events that occur within certain historic, social historical conditions, as is the digital text. When we read the digital archives with students, we're participating in a certain textual event that unfolds in our own historical moment. I have to admit that I didn't at first realize all of the consequences of this particular textual event. I had foolishly thought in the beginning that I would find a single platform for all of my students to use, one with stable page numbers that would allow annotation. I had in mind then something like a paper text, only on screen. When I gave the students the URL for Ozora Bunko's version of Garasu no Naka, however, I was shocked when they came back to class toting what they had prepared. A couple of students had printed out the stories and had written in notes by hand. Others were reading the work on laptop screens. When I asked, I found some of the laptop users were reading online and others were reading PDFs. One student had an iPad, but, re but, re but, but what really shocked me was that two students were reading on their iPhones. They were to spend the rest of the semester peering into their tiny screens. My initial reaction was to panic, since my prior experience with teaching a reading course involving having every student looking dutifully at their copy of the course pack. Uh, for example, how in this situation was I going to tell students to go to line 5 on page 10? But there was nothing to do but press on with the knowledge that every member of the class was reading something different. Different in terms of hardware, different in terms of software or app, different in terms of fonts and formatting. It became clear to me that reading in the age of Alzora meant that people were reading a fluid text while sharing a his social historical context. I guess I could have distributed the text as a PDF and demanded that everyone read it on their various devices. But I was too intrigued with what was happening. And of course, part of the reason for the experiment was to allow students to interface with texts in their preferred forms. In order to keep the class together, I learned to project a version of the text so that I could refer to this as we discussed it. Here, I've put up Agawa Hiroyuki's debut work, Nen Nen Sai Sai, from the Penn Digital Library. The story takes place in 1946 and follows a young naval officer from the moment of his, of his repatriation to Fukuoka from China through his train ride from there to Hiroshima and then his first few days in the destroyed city where he's unexpectedly reunited with his family. In the class, I follow the text projected on the screen with a laser pointer and ask comprehension questions in Japanese to gauge understanding. I have students translate passages that are difficult, 
And when problems arise, I explain grammar in English. As we talk about the text, I ask students what resources they've used to prepare, and I also model for them what they might have accessed on their own hardware or via, via the web. If students seem to be having vocabulary problems, I can show them readings via Likai-chan, um, which students just love because it removes the drudgery of using uh, a character dictionary. You can see the first uh, character compound that students run into is fukuin, which is vocabulary that most fourth or fifth year Japanese language students uh, would, would not have. Nikai Chan pulls up the reading and uh, the, the definition immediately. I also show how students might have gotten more information. Uh, in this case, the uh, same word searched on the web uh, gives us uh, um, a Google entry or a, a Wikipedia entry on Fukuin, demobilization, and that page has uh, uh, a 1945 photo of a repatriation train that was taken in uh, Hiroshima. This kind of jumping from uh, uh, text to Google to Wikipedia is something that many students will already have done on their own. One problem with uh, this text that will bother some students is that it uses kyukanazukai. When we first run into the shiteki kanazukai, I introduce some useful websites, like, uh, uh, like this one. And then uh, once they know how to get around this website, they can get very quickly to these kinds of conversions. I generally don't have to bother working with kana readings in class because students know where to go for them. Web references, then, allow students to access information far beyond what could have been presented in a vocabulary list. What the text makes available is a hypertextually enrich enriched text. Let me give you a few further examples. Another puzzling term in the first paragraph of the story is gaishoken, or ration ticket for eating out. Uh, this is uh, a historically special, specific term from the occupation period. A web search not only provides information about what a gaishoken was, but also an image of an actual ration ticket from 1946. Place names are also puzzles to students. The main character of Nen Nen Sai Sai, Michio, lands at the port of uh, Hakata, where uh, he first lands after he's repatriated from China. Not only is the place name immediately legible in a web-based reading, but also the place can be located on uh, on a map. Moreover, as Michio travels by train toward Hiroshima, students can continue to follow his route um, uh, along the Sanyo Honsen train line. During part of the story, there's a flashback to Michio's time in Shanghai and a reference to the Wangpu River. This is a situation that really would have thrown students on a, in, a, in a paper reading because they would have had to go, go to a, a Chinese place name dictionary to find this. Uh, Web-based searching like this uh, works uh, beautifully here with uh, uh, providing uh, an indication of what the Wangpu River is and uh, with even uh, a photograph, as you can, uh, you can see. Web searching, moreover, allows access to things that wouldn't turn up in any standard dictionary. While the train is stopped at a small station in Yamaguchi, Michio and his fellow soldiers see a station attendant stealing miso from a tub. One of them calls out, Ginbai suru nara motto oshikake ni yare yo. The term ginbai is something that would stump most students. 
but reading on the web, a student can search for Ginbai and find, oops, this is wrong because uh, uh, a 1980s rock group from Yokohama uh, doesn't seem right for this particular, uh, th this particular story. I suggest to students that when they're looking for definitions, they type imi after a term. And then this brings up a, a, a site for military slang where we find the term ginbai. It turns out that the slang use of ginbai originated in the, uh, in the Navy. Uh, so it turns out that uh, this is vocabulary that's appropriate for Michio, who has served in that branch of the military. As you can see, the web can take us deeper into the discourse of the story, uh, deeper into the historical context in which it unfolds. Here, as uh, Michio first enters the city of Hiroshima, the kagikako around the term Genshi Sabaku, atomic desert, makes it clear that this is a keyword and that the text is quoting from the discourse of the period. A web search for this term brings up pages like this one, which quotes from a 1946 magazine article that talks about how weeds can be seen growing in the atomic desert. This reference underlies the, his, underlines the historical accuracy of Michio's experience when he sees weeds as well as wheat growing in empty lots across the city. Another example of using the web to connect to historical context, context occurs when Michio's cousin complains that he can't study because he keeps on hearing this, the song, Come Come Everybody on the radio. A search for uh, Come Come Everybody provides not only the information that this was the theme song of an explosively popular English, English conversation class broadcast on NHK, but also the song itself. It really was brilliant for uh, whoever chose this theme song to uh, use the melody for shosho shoshoji, uh, because it's a great way to make learning a foreign language a more familiar experience. Another example of uh, a song reference in the story occurs when Michio starts to sing uh, a war song here. His cousin quickly tells Michio to shut up because someone will slug him if they hear him singing it. A search gives us the full lyrics, uh, which makes clear why the song isn't appropriate in occupied Japan. Uh, I won't do this, but you can play on this side. You can also play the melody for the uh, war song as, uh, uh, as well. The web's capacity to help with specific languages and discourses is apparent as well in the case of dialect, another thing that the students sometimes have trouble with. In this passage, we can see that the narrator is narrating to an audience outside of Hiroshima because he provides a gloss for the Hiroshima Ben uh, Ogo-san. But he doesn't provide a gloss for other things, like uh, tsukasaiyo. 
if you search for Tsukasayo on the web, you uh, immediately come up with uh, uh, the definition in uh, standard Japanese. Let me end with a final example. The story concludes by quoting the Tang poem from which it gets its title. This is a famous couplet, but one that the average student won't know. A quick search yields the poem by Liu Shi'i, from which it comes, as well as the Japanese reading of the poem. This background allows a discussion in class about the significance to the story of the couplet, about the cyclical, performance, cyclical permanence of nature versus the impermanence of man. Does the poem here uphold the thematics of the story? Or is its use perhaps ironic? I tend to say the latter, because the story celebrates the resilience of human relations, even in the midst of cataclysmic events. I hope I've managed to show you some of the advantages of the digital archive in teaching reading classes. The use of digital references removes some of the drudgery of dictionary work, making the transition to independent reading a little easier. I think it makes it more likely that students will eventually read Japanese fiction outside of class. The breadth of available digital references makes possible hypertextual cultural annotation that carries us further into the study of the text, which I think is the goal of all teachers of literature when they find themselves teaching a reading course. Good luck with your efforts at using digital archives in your classes. I think you'll have fun. <laughs>